So, welcome to the life of Christ. Um, we are in the next 12 weeks. We're going to learn all about Jesus. Um, the class is out in the for spring break. I said before, I don't know why they didn't do their spring break this week and do it straight through, but we have one week and then we're on break and then we'll come back. So. That's good. Well, that's perfect. I'm glad, I'm glad it lines up with our spring break here, so at least that's convenient. Um, we are going to cover a lot in this class. We're going to cover the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the life of Jesus. I have kind of bounced around how to do it because I could do kind of the historical background of geography and stuff up front. Um, that's not what I'm going to do. I'm going to do it as it comes up, as we go. So we're going to go through the life of Jesus chronologically, and when you need to know some geography or history or whatever to understand that, then we'll zigzag back and forth. I don't know if that's the best way or not, but um, it's what we're going to do. If you look in populated the textbook, it gives you two. Um, one is the life of Christ, which are uh, Daryl Owens, who preached our Bible a couple of years ago. He taught a class through Mark, and they basically took his lecture notes and made it into a like a two hundred page bulleted book that you can get to use as a reference. Um, and the other one that we're going to use is also I, I think that that one's free. It may be three dollars or whatever to download the PDF or something from them, but. Um, the other one is free, and that's The Training of the Twelve by Amy Bruce. We're not going to use that this week, but it is a harmony of the Gospels, which is something that will make more sense in just a little bit. So we are going to cover all that. We are going to, throughout this course, um, there are, and populate for this one, they can have you do uh, four memory verses one verse that you do a little quiz on and populate, that's a small portion of your grade. Uh, in this class, rather than have you guys do a class project, you're going to do two four-page papers, but they're double-spaced four-page papers, so 700 or 800 words or something. So I have the utmost confidence in you. Um, and then there's some multiple choice tests that we'll talk about more um, as we go. Class is going to roughly follow uh, the outline of Mark. Mark has 16 chapters, so uh, once we get going, we will do uh, about a chapter, uh, about two chapters a week. We're not, not quite. Um, I'm going to deviate from the schedule and the syllabus some, the, and I'm going to try to get my own version of their syllabus put up. This week, uh, my, I thought I'd be able to do it today. My grandfather's surgery to get his spine stabilized. I mentioned journal today. Uh, he, the tumor, his lung tumor, has spread to his spine and has eaten up one of his vertebrae. And the doctor said that they needed to go in and put two metal bars to connect the vertebrae on either side, um, or he was very likely to be paralyzed. It's the 92 percent chance of paralysis if they didn't do anything. Um, so they were doing that surgery. It was supposed to be at eight, and it was not. Uh, yes. So the, uh, by the time they got started, it was 10.30. By the time they sent us the little text, it said he was asleep, it was almost noon. And so that's where my parents are. It's still with him, and I left there and got here about 30 or 40 minutes ago and tried to scramble everything together. I thought I was going to be here a lot sooner today. Um, so I haven't gotten a chance to get some of that stuff. I also don't have your pronouns for your slides, but I will get the PowerPoint and populate and we'll go from there. So uh, other than that, I'll make uh, explain this as we go. The research paper we're kind of doing uh, a couple of pieces. Um, we'll talk more about it next week uh, or in the week after spring break, and then the third week. You'll kind of have to work on it, and then it'll be due the fourth week. And then toward the end of class, we'll have the second research paper. And I'll talk about topics and stuff, but it'll be 
make sense when we get there. So, uh, any questions about that just kind of basic housekeeping stuff? Cool, let's go. I was teaching Sunday school this week for the high school class because I have not found somebody to take that over yet. And we were talking about Jonah and about the Ninevites and about what like wicked people the Ninevites were and how Jonah had to go and preach to them anyway. Um, the I was giving examples and saying, okay, so if Hitler was here and you had to forgive Hitler, you know, how would you respond to that? Or Stalin. And then I said, or Saddam Hussein. And they didn't know who Saddam Hussein was. Because uh, Saddam Hussein died in 2003, 2004. Um, and that was 16 years ago. And so they were babies who were not born yet when Saddam Hussein died. Uh, which was an eye opening experience for me. Um, they knew that Osama bin Laden had something to do with 9 11. And that was all they knew about Osama bin Laden. So it was really. Disturbing experience the high schoolers. It gets worse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they knew who Osama bin Laden was, I guess, because he died more recently uh, you know, during the Obama administration, but it didn't occur to me how long ago Saddam Hussein's execution was. So, our first little thing we're going to do tonight is I'm going to have each one of you give me three to five bullet points going through who Saddam Hussein was, but I'm going to give each one of you a different audience. So, Jake. You are going to explain who Saddam Hussein was for your daughter. <laughs> In three to five bullet points, you are going to explain who Saddam Hussein is to somebody who is an adult, who was an adult at the time of the Iraq War and everything, who already has a basic understanding, and you're kind of filling in the blanks for them, kind of giving them an overview. And <laughs> Then those are both, yeah, that's an, an American who has this as part of their history. You are going to give it to me from the perspective of a teenager like Jake, except somebody who was Canadian or something that their country was not heavily involved in the war in Iraq, so that might shape your presentation. So each one of you come up with three to five bullet points. Are we allowed to utilize resources? Yes, you can utilize resources. You can utilize resources. <laughs> Guys, uh, I'll give you five minutes to think about that.
guys came up with. Let me uh I'm gonna say beard is man, but that is man.
Here we have three different accounts of the same one. They are all right. Uh, there are things that all of them leave out, because I only gave you a limited amount of space and limited bullets. You know, so you, we could put, if we were going to tell this story, and we were trying to be exhaustive, uh, where would you even start? Right? I mean, do you start with the Crusades and the Ottoman Empire and how the Muslim world became so fractured and European colonization and the, the division? You know, or do you start further back than that with how um, when Muhammad died, there was nobody to take over Islam, and so it split into Sunni and Shia, and so Iraq and Iran fell into different brands of Islam, and so they had this ongoing tension. Uh, it's how the Kurds ultimately were not the same kind of Muslim as Saddam Hussein, and so he begins using weapons of mass destruction on them in 91. Or, I mean, do you go further, kind of in the middle, and say, well, uh, historically, in the, I mean, would you go to the 70s and talk about OPEC and the oil restraints and how, you know, the U.S. became really sensitive to making sure there was a steady supply of oil uh, for both commercial and national security reasons? So you go, <laughs> so I mean, there's a, there's a lot, right? Um, and so what would shape the information we include? Uh, one, the amount of space we have, right? To the kind of point we're trying to make. If I was doing, so with the United States and the peace talks with the Taliban, uh, which look a lot like surrender talks, but the with that whole situation, would I, if I were telling the story for like a 60 minutes type thing, would I talk about the war in Vietnam? Even though it doesn't have anything to do directly with Iraq, but as a background to how US foreign policy has gone since 1945. Um, or would I, you know, it would depend on who I was talking to. If I was teaching a high school class on this, uh, I think you guys hit some good points, right? They need to know who's the president of Iraq. They need to know about the chemical warfare. Uh, they need to know about the oil element. Um, they need to know about the, the Gulf War, about how he used terrorism to indirect, to maintain plausible deniability while he attacked his neighbors and around the world. Um, if I were talking to an adult, though, I might want to go into a little bit more detail of how it happened, right? About how the um, how he, in, you know, in some ways manipulated the Islamic faith of people in Iraq to make himself untouchable and unchallengeable. You know, I might want to talk about how he, as the leader of the Arab Socialist Party, kind of followed in the footsteps of Hitler with the National Socialist Party. Like, how did they use? terminology differently, perhaps, you know, how does the, I, I might want to make this a lesson on the dangers of totalitarianism if I was talking to adults and saying, what happens when a charismatic totalitarian leader starts exploiting these, like, base instincts of people? So you can see that if I were then going to try to take what you wrote, it would be different for every audience if you were each giving a brief talk, you know, if I gave you five minutes instead of five bullet points, you would give stuff in a different order based on who you were talking to, you would do, you know, different things. Um, it, you would necessarily leave some things out and include other things. Um, you know, that I've been listening to this uh, audio book on the history of the Cold War and thinking about what do people really know and not know about the Cold War. The guy who wrote the book uh, is a professor at Yale, and he was talking, in the introduction of the book, he talks about how freshmen coming to Yale don't know about the Bay of Pigs at all. That's weird. <laughs> like, yeah, the Ivy League institution, they don't know about this major event in world history. That was almost, you know, like the end of history as we know it, right? The end of Western civilization. Um, so if you were giving a talk to them, you would have to start from a different place. If you were going to the senior center and giving a talk on the Cold War, you would start from a different place, right? And everywhere in between. So the other thing is you did not tell me these things in the same order, right? Um, being the chemical warfare, I mean, that's the 90s, and then the attack on neighbors kind of contemporaneous with that. Um, then the 
you know, that he executed any opposition to, and well, really, that was going on the whole time, right? I mean, the, but when you're telling a story, you structure it differently based on who your audience is, based on what they already know, based on who you're talking to, right? So, this is not, of course, a class on the uh, American foreign policy, uh, although I wish there was a college that would let me do one. Uh, this is instead talking about the Gospels. And so, what was this wonky anticipatory set all about? Well, I want to, today, make sure that you can identify the relationship between the synoptic Gospels and John. Why do we have four accounts of the life of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Uh, why are they different? Why are they the same? We need to be able to identify and explain the similarities and differences between the Gospels. And then finally, um, to summarize the events of the infancy narratives of Jesus. That's what we're going to do at the end of class. Uh, we'll spend most of the class doing this introductory stuff that we've been working on. So, when I think about this, if this was the, if these three columns were the only information that somebody had about Saddam Hussein, they would see some overlap, they would see some differences, they might even see what they might anticipate, or they might see as a contradiction, right? Well, this one says it's about the Gulf War, this one says he's not responsible for 9 11, so they're contradicting each other. Uh, of course, we know that they just include different parts of the picture. Um, here, we have that he's the president of Iraq. Here, we've got he's the president of Iraq who led the Arab Socialist Party. They tell the same thing, one with more detail. We see the same thing in the Gospels. We see that the Gospels may include different accounts, they may include different levels of detail, they may, uh, in a thing that's different in ancient narrative than modern narrative, include the same dialogue with different words. You know, like we are really big on verbatim transcripts and stuff, right? Uh, that if somebody's paraphrasing, then it doesn't really count. Uh, the, but in the ancient world, there were no transcripts. I mean, it was, Writing was expensive and time intensive, and you couldn't do it on the spot. They didn't have tape recorders. Um, and so some of the precision we have in modern history it was not present, right? To give another kind of historical example, uh, famously, I think it was uh, Eisenhower who was very poor after he left office and um, wrote his memoirs to uh, kind of build himself up, but he was having a hard time writing his memoirs because he didn't have any uh, real-time records. He was trying to reconstruct everything from memory. And so he suggested, at the time he was writing his memoirs, to his friend, who is currently in the presidency, that he put tape recorders in the Oval Office to use later on. Um, and Richard Nixon turned out to really not. <laughs> 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 We know exactly what was said because there are tapes, right? Um, the, in the ancient world, you know, if the if Matthew says Jesus said such and such, and Luke says he says such and such, they're not putting it in quotation marks like we do and saying these are the exact words that Jesus used. They're telling you the substance of what he said, and that means that we've got to read the Gospels like what they are, like documents that are inspired by God and are accurate, but are not written the way that you and I would write them. And in the same way that if somebody only had these three columns to go on, they could not put together a complete life of Saddam Hussein. In fact, they might struggle to put the chronology together exactly. But roughly, they could piece it together in the same way with the Gospels, we can get a picture of who Jesus was and what he did. Okay. Any questions about that? I hope that all the time we spent on that exercise makes it clearer, you know, what we're talking about. Um, so you're, uh, in Populi, there's this chart that, I don't know who uh, Jim Earhart is, but there's this chart they put together that's uh, a helpful little summary you can uh, get off there. Uh, Matthew presents Jesus as king. Uh, he, the audience is Jewish people. Uh, he quotes the Old Testament a lot. Uh, the emphasis is on prophecy fulfilled. It begins with Abraham through David and ends with the resurrection. Mark. It presents Jesus as 
the suffering servant. If you remember from the New Testament survey, we talked about that, that Mark, the failed servant, uh, was the one who wrote the picture of Jesus as the perfect servant. His audience was generally to the Romans, and his is on the gospel of action. Anybody remember what word Mark uses over and over again? Immediately. 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 Uh, there's no real ending. It just kind of, uh, there's no, I'm sorry, no real beginning. It just says the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ is not of It ends with the ascension of Jesus to heaven. No idea why it has that little apostrophe there. I hyphen in there. I just screech on it. Uh, Luke described Jesus as the son of man. His audience is Greeks more generally, and his emphasis is on ideas. You know, the what did Jesus teach? It begins with Adam. So while Matthew, writing to the Jews, uh, begins with Adam, uh, sorry, while Matthew, writing to the Jews, begins with Abraham and David, uh, Luke, writing to the Gentiles, goes all the way back to Adam. See, instead of splitting off there, he goes uh, to Adam. And it ends with the promise of the Holy Spirit, uh, John, the one that's different, uh, it presents Jesus as the Son of God. Uh, his audience is everybody. His emphasis is spiritual. When John was written, Matthew, Mark, and Luke had long been circulated. And so John, the last living apostle, wrote John to give some more detail uh, to the things that were already seen. Uh, it begins in eternity past. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. And it ends with an invitation. Uh, these things are written so that you may believe. So, um, to use my world famous chart, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke.
to accomplish his foreign policy goals that uh, including uh, weapons of mass destruction that uh, the he became through a long period of uh, conflict with his neighbors and demonization of the United States, uh, an enemy of the United States, until ultimately the United States went and invaded the, the Gulf War. Uh, then, sidebar, uh, there was always much debate about how much of this was motivated by love of the Kurds and how much was by U.S. dependence on foreign oil. Uh, decades later, uh, the fact that they were open 5 to, I guess, and then Gulf of War with that was monopolized oil and they ran by much of international law. Um, much later, he was thought to be indirectly responsible for September 11th. And I didn't include that then the United States invaded again. He was tried and executed uh, in public. It's kind of gruesome. But you can see uh, 1575, 355576486369522. Like they're out of order. So they make sense on their own. <laughs> and if I didn't have a little bit of background information, it would be hard for me to piece them together. They can be pieced together. Okay? That's what we're doing with the gospel. We are trying to take Matthew, Mark, and Luke especially, uh, to a lesser extent John, just because it's so different, and put them together in harmony. We use harmony in writing, music, and things like that. We use harmony is when the different notes play one song. Uh, we do harmonies generally. Um, I mean, you can do it on your own. But one of the best resources that you can have is one of these books called A Harmony of the Gospel. Let's see if I can't do the cropping on this screen here. If you have Lotus, then one of my favorites is this uh, CSB Harmony of the Gospels. And let me show you how it works. It's they have them in print from the olden days, ancient times. Uh, the will is power, but uh, the, it is much easier, of course, to use in the computer. So you can't really see it, uh, but on the left side, it's got the table of contents, Harmony of the Gospels, and it goes through each phase of Jesus' life. Then on the main part of it, it has, in this case, the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew and then in Luke. So one in Matthew from 1, 1 through 17, one in Luke from 3, 23 b through 38. If I scroll a little bit further, uh, Gabriel predicting John's birth is in Luke alone. And so it is here, this is in Luke alone. Uh, let's go Mark in chapter 6, Luke in chapter 9, and John in chapter 6. And what the harmony does is it puts the four of them side by side by side so that you can read them together and see where they are similar and where they are distinct. Um, don't get too excited. We're going to do that as an exercise in just a second. Uh, but you can see when I go to the next one, here it's Matthew 14, Mark 6, and John 6. That's a bad example. Uh, here, to the next major event, it's Matthew 15, Mark 7, John 7, all right.
system and puts it together. Now, that is sometimes easy, like in this case, um, Matthew 16, Mark 8, and Luke 9. Uh, so the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there are some standing here which will not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Mark, when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel is the same shall find it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man gain in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there shall be some that stand here who shall not taste of death, but they say the kingdom of God come with power. Finally, for whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him uh, shall the Son of Man be ashamed, when he shall come in his own glory, and his fathers, and of the holy angels. But I tell you the truth, there be some standing here who shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. So how did the harmony, the person who put this book together, find out, you know, kind of say, these are probably describing the same event? Well, Matthew and Luke line up here. Uh, Verily I say unto you, there's some standing here. I tell you the truth, there'll be some standing here, which will not taste that the same. Uh, the, well then, uh, Mark matches what was at the beginning here, when the he'll come and reward those for his coming, right? So they, they piece them together. Now, what's, I guess, complicated for us is why are they put together in this way? Obviously, they're written to different audiences, but how can we sort of see the way that they come together? Which leads me to my next trick. I'm quite proud of this tablet paper. <laughs> it is if you, uh, it's two sheets of letter size paper, and so I really like it because if you fold it in half, you've got two sheets of letter, so if you make a newsletter or something, it's just, it's nice. So, and in this case, it lets me put everything all on one page. What I want you to do, and we're not, you don't have time to do it all, um, because uh, it's 647, so we're about halfway through the time we have. Um, but I want you to look at these and see where do Matthew, Mark, um, I put Luke and John in, but John, Matthew, it doesn't have a parallel passage, where Matthew, Mark, and Luke all agree, we're going to highlight that in one color, where Matthew and Mark agree, but Luke doesn't say the same thing, we're going to do a different color, Mark and Luke agree in a different color, Matthew and Luke in a third color. This is not something that we're going to try to be like exact about. Um, I'm just trying to help us make a point about what's going on. Let me grab some crayons out of one of these classrooms. And we will color. Oh, we're all ready. <laughs> you should tell me he took this and then now he's going to Yeah, now that I know. This was like the orientation part. <laughs> so you're putting us to work already. It's supposed to be like the orientation. <laughs> well, we've only got 12 weeks. Last time we had 13 weeks. That's how we make the most of every moment. So that have to be for random, but it's if it yeah, it's yeah. Okay. yes, yeah. If they parallel each other.
Um, this one gives us the opportunity to be much more hands on, which I think is interesting.
Mark, what, what's Mark the Gospel of? He's a he described Jesus as a servant, but he's the gospel of action. action. <laughs> uh, so he's to the point. He's to the point. He's yeah. concerned about what Jesus did and not so much about what Jesus taught. Matthew, as the gospel to the Jews, really emphasizes how Jesus was rejected by the Jewish leaders, the Sadducees and the Pharisees as well. Like the whole way through. Matthew's a really dreary gospel. Like it's constant opposition. While uh, Luke gives a more full or more detailed picture. And as somebody who's interested in Jesus' teaching, he points out sometimes the aspects of Jesus' teaching that even the Sadducees had to recognize, okay, good for me. And so you can kind of see why they're all telling the same story. None of them are lying, but they die, and they, you know, they give different levels of, of detail. Anything else that stands out to you from this exercise? Uh, a lot of the way that <clears throat> things can be brought about in a statement or a question. Mm -hmm. I think that that's one of the things that can make a difference in tone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Can you notice that um, in Matthew, when he is describing the, in verse 31 in Matthew, uh, he's explaining what's going on. He says, For the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? Uh, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. In Mark, in verse uh, 26, and as to the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the book, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Um, and then in Luke, uh, verse 37, but even as the dead are raised, the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the book when he calls the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Uh, so they, obviously Jesus quoted uh, Exodus 3 when he was talking to them. But it's interesting that he says in Matthew, don't you know what God said? In Mark, he says, you know, Moses writes how God said. And then in Luke, he says, you know, even Moses showed here. Uh, for that, you need a little bit of historical background. The Sadducees um, were the ultra-conservative party, uh, so much that they didn't believe in any books of the Bible except for Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and the of Deuteronomy, the Torah, um, the Law, the Pentateuch. The, they didn't believe in the other uh, 34 books of the Old Testament. The Pharisees did. And the Pharisees, not only did they believe in the rest of the Old Testament, they believed in their oral law and the, all that stuff too. It's recorded now for us in the Mishnah and in the Talmud and stuff like that. So the, the Sadducees were particularly interested with what Moses wrote. In fact, when they come and they introduce their question in all three Gospels, they said, Teacher, Moses wrote for us, right? Moses said. And so Jesus doesn't use uh, some of the other passages in the Old Testament that talk about the resurrection, like uh, the valley of dry bones in Ezekiel, or in Job, where he says, in my flesh I'll see God. Instead, because they brought Moses to him, he quotes back Moses to them. In writing to a Jewish audience, he reminds them that God was the ultimate author, but in Mark and Luke, he uh, reports the, the emphasis about how the uh, even the book of Moses that they would claim didn't have anything to do with the resurrection. How already in Genesis or in Exodus, the, it was already revealed back in Exodus 3. I think that's interesting too. So sometimes we want to look for the things that are the same, and sometimes we want to look for the things that are different, right? Um, the I want to caution us here, though. Harmonization useful thing because we believe that these things actually happen to them. When they actually happen, they actually happen in a certain order. But we also have to take seriously that God didn't give us one, you know, Jesus, the authorized biography, right? He gave us four. And so we want to not fall into either extreme. We want to recognize what Matthew says, what Mark says, and what Luke says on their own terms and what John says. But we 
also want to have the good sense to be able to come and bring them you know, together. This is kind of an easy one, right? There's no obvious like conflicts here. Uh, as we get further in the course, I'm going to give you some that are a little bit tougher. They're going to stretch our brains a little bit more to put them together. But I thought that getting some hands-on kind of it's one thing for me to tell you they have overlap and even read to you they have overlap. It's a different thing for you to take your highlighter and see the overlap. So do you guys kind of see the connection between this and the stuff that Snow was saying we talked about? Is they're writing for different audiences at different times who have different levels of information, different interests, and they tailor their message to each one. So some leave some stuff out. The stuff that they all include is probably especially important, or at least especially necessary to be clear. And that is uh, how the Gospels work together. So the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are the ones that have a lot of overlap. Occasionally, very occasionally, John will include the same information that they do. Uh, to, okay. Uh, so that is the, we've got about 20 minutes left uh, to talk about the infancy narrative. So I can see now why on the syllabus he put that on next week. Um, but we're going to try. So any questions about harmonization, the Gospels, all that stuff? All good? All my clear? Okay. Uh, let me show you a video. Oh. A video. <coughs> So you have each of those. Oh, I 
I see why there's a problem. Somehow, uh, my computer is trying to connect to the internet at the parsonage. The signal is not great. <laughs> So you've got the, the wise men, the shepherds, uh, probably some angel. You've got angels in your nativity scene. And then uh, Mary and Joseph. You can tell that was Joseph by the beard. Got Mary and Joseph and the uh, cattle and Uh, oh, it's, it's a silent night. All is calm, all is bright. Wow. Um, so, um, Martin Luther wrote Silent Night. Um, Martin Luther also was an avowed bachelor until late in his life, and apparently did not know anything about babies. <laughs> got married after he wrote Silent Night, but I'm pretty sure that he had kids after he wrote Silent Night. Um, we had uh, Sam is a year and a half old, and he was three, and there have not been a lot of Silent Nights, Holy Nights, All is Calm, All is Bright for us. Um, well, I do not know what the deal is. So, how many of these things in this classic nativity scene are actually matched up by the Bible? Well, uh, one thing that we know, which might be a little uncomfortable for us, is that the when we read the Gospels, when Matthew, uh, well, when the when they came to when the wise men came, they came to a house. Uh, not to a manger. And it actually describes Jesus as a uh, boy when they came to the manger. When Herod came and he ordered the execution of all the babies under the age of two, that would be a weird thing if the wise men got there that night. So actually, part of our problem is that we need, we need two nativity scenes. We've got to bring the We've got our manger nativity scene for the barn, and then, oh! We all know how a nativity scene looks. Mary, Joseph, and baby Jesus in a stable, surrounded by assorted barnyard animals, shepherds, and three wise men. But it may have been more consoling than we imagine. In the Gospel of Luke, there is no mention of an innkeeper or barn. In Bethlehem, the
is entirely possible that two wise men brought three gifts, or that eight wise men, three of them brought gold, two of them brought, you know, I mean, we, we don't know. Um, frankincense is incense, that was burned. Myrrh is oil, like uh, scented oil, like perfume. Gold is this yellow, soft pebble, uh, good for making jewelry and stuff. So they, of course, were all valuable in the ancient world. So you've got these wise men, we don't know how many, that came probably about two years later. So the ideal thing for your nativity would be to do this one one year and this one the next year, just alternate back and forth. Just keep everybody on their toes. Um, silent, so of course there's no biblical record that it was a silent night. Probably there was crying and all that. And when we come to this whole no room in the inn, of course, that was not um, Motel 6. Uh, the, the, there was no room in the house. The, in those days, people lived in kind of uh, apartment type buildings. And with all the people that had come for the census, it was all full. The city of David. The royal lineage of Joseph to David suggests that someone would make extra room for Mary and Joseph. Indoor mangers have been found in the daytime living quarters of first century Jewish households. They would lodge animals of value or shelter them from the cold. This is unlike the modern perception of a barn manger that is detached from the domestic setting. The Greek word used for the inn that was full also translates to guest room. It's the same word for the upper room of the Last Supper. In settling for the ground room with the animals, the focus shifts from exclusion and outcast to invitational. All fine details aside, Jesus is the center of our story and came to be the center of our lives as we remember his birth and look forward to his return. Thank you. 
pictures back then were not little wooden X things. They were stone troughs. So Jesus was laying in a stone trough. Which, if you're looking for a place to lay a baby, there are worse places. And to make it soft or whatever. Um, the, I'm going to come back to this. This is uh, the Church of the Nativity in Jerusalem. Uh, allegedly, based on like a historical tradition, this is the place in Bethlehem where Jesus was laid. Uh, it's, it's attached to a cave. They would sometimes build houses off of caves and stuff for the safety and security. Um, obviously, we don't actually know. The reason that there's at least a chance that this was actually the place that Jesus was born is that in like the 4th century the archaeologists say that a church was built there. It's kind of a strange place to build a church unless there was some kind of like a tradition passed down from person to person that this was the place that Jesus was born. Um, the thing counting against that is that for you know 30 some odd years after Jesus was born nobody thought that was a special place at all. And so it could go either way. But you can see they claim this is the spot. You can go in and wait in a very long line to get a very dark glimpse of it if you want. We did. Um, <laughs> hip, hip, hooray. Uh, so that's, that's fine. But that's in Bethlehem. Bethlehem today is um, a, uh, an Arab city, a uh, Palestinian city. And so it's a, a little bit different. It's a little bit more difficult to go to anyway. Uh, so the wise men that we call wise men, uh, some translations call them the magi. They were astrologers, and they looked at the sky and they saw a star, and they said, "Oh, they, this must be a harbinger of something significant." It's interesting that in Matthew, the gospel written to the Jews, it's the Gentiles who see nature and recognize what God's doing better from nature than the Jews do with the Bible. Like there's a weirdness. But remember, Matthew's this really dark gospel about the hardness of their hearts and how they rejected him over and over. Right? So these wise men uh, from the East, probably that one, we don't really know, come and uh, presumably come up to Israel. Uh, they, they would travel in this direction for a couple different reasons, safety and whatever else. And they, they came down, went to Jerusalem, and asked Herod, where is he that's born king of the Jews? And so the scribes looked up and said, well, the king of the Jews will be born in Bethlehem. Now, at 17 to 23 miles a day, um, a, it would take 120 days to walk from Babylon to Israel, or to Bethlehem. That's a long time. So, again, if we're imagining when did this happen, how many activities do we get, if you think, okay, they see the star, they come, they make preparations, they load up, they go, and then they, you know, they, they come to Bethlehem, well, let's say, let's make preparations, maybe you're a year later. And so when Herod says, we're going to kill all the babies who are under the age of two, maybe that it's separated by a year. So it's from zero to two years, somewhere in that range. Uh, and we can see that. Uh, 17 to 23 miles a day is pretty, pretty realistic. Right? If you walk two or three miles an hour at like a, a leisurely normal pace for a day, um, you know, two miles an hour for 12 hours is 24 miles, but you've got to stop to eat, you've got to, you know, do all those things. Uh, traveling in a caravan in difficult terrain could reduce travel time to about six miles a day. If we assume for a second that they had to go at six miles a day the whole way, you're talking about a two year trip. Which would be a very, very long way to go. Uh, but we, we don't know. Uh, the, some of the terrain is difficult, especially north of Jerusalem up toward Jericho. Uh, extremely hilly. Okay, uh, now back to here. Okay, so. Uh, the infancy narratives of Jesus as much have much less information than a modern biography. In fact, only Matthew and Luke give us the infancy of Jesus at all. Um, Mark just begins with Jesus' ministry. John begins with Jesus you know, in eternity past and says the word became flesh, but doesn't describe Jesus as a baby. Only Matthew and Luke do. Uh, there are good reasons for this. Matthew 
is interested in portraying Jesus as the Jewish Messiah, and so he has to legitimize him by his genealogy. Luke is interested in describing Jesus as the Son of Man, and as the Son of Man is interested in showing how he's the new Adam, but is human just like us. And so they both have this unique interest there. Um, it's much more interesting, they're much more interested in how Jesus was unique than some of the other things we might want to study. You know, we might want to know, what was Jesus like when he was 10? You know, did, did the fact that he was perfect mean that he never, you know, cried when he fell down? Was, well, we, we might have some of these questions, but the Bible apparently doesn't care. <laughs> it is really much more interested in telling us who Jesus was. Um, the Magi, the wise men from the East, are in Matthew and not in Luke. The shepherds are in Luke and not in Matthew. Why are the shepherds recorded in Luke? We already talked about why the Magi might be recorded in Matthew, that these Gentiles are smarter than the Jewish elites were. Um, why would the shepherds be recorded in Matthew, in Luke, I mean? Any guesses? What do you know about shepherds? Sheep. Sheep, yes. And why? Is that a like, white collar job? Blue collar. Blue collar job. Very blue collar. Very every man. Uh, they're sleeping outside with their smelly sheep. <coughs> so, Luke is interested in portraying Jesus as the Son of Man, as the one who's for everybody. And so he begins with these shepherds. These, the angels come and announce the news to these shepherds who go to the house uh, where this poor girl and her poor husband are staying to see this little baby. Like an angel. The, they recognize him. They say, how will we know which one it is? And the angels say, you'll find him wrapped in swaddling clothes. That's pretty normal. We swaddle all babies lying in a manger. That's less normal. And so they say, you'll identify him by his humility. Uh, this is a fulfillment of a prophecy in Isaiah. In Isaiah, it says, um, the ox knows its master and the donkey, the, the ox knows its owner and the donkey its master's crib, but my people don't know Israel does not consider. And so he says that a and the animals know who feeds them. He says that my people don't recognize who feeds them. Jesus in the manger, the animals, you know, know that he is their maker, and the people don't. That's kind of interesting as well. So we're going to kind of weave this together just to uh, summarize the... Uh, we don't know anything about Jesus' childhood except when he's teaching in the temple that we'll talk about next week. Uh, genealogy. I'm going to talk fast. Uh, the... Matthew apparently records Mary's genealogy from Abraham, and uh, Luke apparently records Joseph's from Adam. So they both give this genealogy. They both end with Joseph, but that was kind of a legal thing. Some people believe a slightly different explanation that if it weren't 730, I would tell you. Um, but apparently, Matthew records Jesus' genetic ancestry, and Luke, because when Joseph adopts Jesus, treats him as his own son, um, records his legal ancestry. So he's the heir to the throne because of his ancestry through Joseph. Um, he is the dis literal descendant of David, as Mary's, you know, tenth cousin or something, through um, Mary. Okay? If you look at the two Gospels side by side, you'll, you'll see that. Now, this is important. Joseph could not be the heir because God put a curse on Jeconiah. You'll we'll find this in Jeremiah 22, 30. Uh, this is what the Lord says. Record this man, King Jeconiah, as childless, a man who will not be successful in his lifetime. He, Jeconiah was a wicked king, and God says, treat him like someone who's childless. He was not childless, but the, the throne will not be passed on to his descendants. That's the rest of the verse. None of his descendants will succeed in sitting on the throne of David or ruling again in Judah. So through Joseph, uh, Jesus was the descendant through Jeconiah, who would have ordinarily been the king. But he was just adopted there. His DNA, his blood came from Mary who was through uh, the other side. And when the, you know, it's like if something happened to the King of England or the Queen of England, the ancestry would jump to her brother, right? Um, 
No, it would jump to her son. If she had a brother, it would jump to her brother. You know, it would, it, the, in the same way, when Jeconiah was disqualified as king, it jumps to his cousins. And uh, that's the line that Mary comes from. So, the uh, ancestry of Jesus is given in those, those two different ways. So, we're going to kind of put the infancy narratives together. Um, we would see a couple of differences. Luke tells the birth of Jesus through five hymns. Uh, most famous one, Hail Mary, Full of Grace, the Magnificat. Uh, the, but he, if you read through the infancy narratives in Luke, you'll see five different hymns. Uh, it's a very joyous one. Matthew, though, is much more emphasized on the rejection of Jesus. They're both true, but just like we were talking about Saddam Hussein, different points for different people, he tells them different perspectives, different emphases. Uh, we see that even in the Magi versus the Shepherds, it, this distinction between who recognized him and who did not. So to kind of put it together, Jesus was born. There was a census under Quirinius. And that made Jesus' family travel from Nazareth, where they were from, to Bethlehem. Bethlehem was the city where the Messiah had to be born. That should be a half, but I ran out of it. Um, Nazareth to Bethlehem. When he was there, there was no space in the guest room. And so to fulfill, it's born of a virgin and all that too, I guess I shouldn't. Shouldn't just plow through that. He's the son of God and the son of Mary, not the son of Joseph. So he's fully human and fully divine. Uh, there's no space in the guest room, so he was laid in a manger. And the angels came to the shepherds who came to worship. Sometime later, the wise men, or magi, came to Herod and found Jesus in a house where they offered gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Herod got mad when they didn't come back through and slaughtered all the babies under two in the area of Bethlehem. Now that sounds really bad. We'll talk more about Herod next week and explain why this is actually exactly the kind of thing Herod would do. Pilate famously said, I'd rather be Herod's pig than his son. Um, so Herod slaughtered the innocents, but Joseph had already fled, and Jesus and his family went to Egypt. They went to Egypt, and they were there until Herod died, and then they returned to Nazareth, where they had been from originally, where Jesus was called a Nazarene, somebody from Nazareth who was rejected, who was not treated as the Messiah, ultimately laid the course out for his whole life. That is the infancy of Jesus in a nutshell. And probably, I spent too much time on our little synoptic gospel exercises because there's some things there that I didn't say that maybe I should have. But, any questions or anything about any of this? Hopefully you learned something, probably not about this particular part because it's Christmas. Which one is the celebration then? Uh, um, Luke. 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 Yes, Luke tells, if you read through Luke, it has five hymns in it. Um, the... And the pain is Matthew. Yes, Matthew describes it in... Uh, Matthew, the whole way through, is a real downer. Uh, Luke, the... When... Uh, the angels come, it's suddenly there was an angel with the multitude of the heavenly host with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth to people who favor it. That's the first one. Uh, then when, uh, I'm sorry, that's not the first one, that's the second one. The first one is Mary. Uh, Mary said, My soul praises the greatness of the Lord. Uh, Verses 46 through 55, Mary sings a hymn praising God when she finds out she's going to have a baby. In Luke chapter 1, verses 68 
through 79, Zechariah, John the Baptist's dad, sings a hymn about uh, the birth of John the Baptist. That's the second one. The third one, the angels sing a hymn in Luke 2, 14. Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth, the people he favors. Um, Luke 2, 29 through 32, when, uh, Zechar when Simeon, who is a priest in the temple, hears, uh, sees Jesus, he also sings a hymn. And so in the first two chapters of Luke, there's five poems of praise to God. And so Luke is this really joyful triumph. Anything else? All right. Head loose. We'll see you guys next, not next week, following week. Take your synoptic gospel worksheet and think about it. If you get a chance this week to read...